Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to this uh, book event uh, to celebrate and discuss courting, courting death, the Supreme Court and capital punishment. My name is Maximo Langer. I am a professor here uh, at the law school. I am also the faculty director of the criminal justice program that is organizing the event, uh, that it's also co-sponsored by the uh, Prison Law and Policy Program, by the Critical Race Studies Program, and the Public Interest Law Program here at UCLA. Thank you also to Alicia Virani for all her work to organize the uh, event. Uh, Alicia is the new Associate Director of our Criminal Justice Program, and we are very pleased to have her here. We are delighted to have with us a very distinguished panel to discuss this book. For starters, the two authors, uh, Carol Steiker and Jordan Steiker. Let me just very briefly say that Carol Steiker is the Henry J. Friendly Professor of Law and a Special Advisor for Public Service at Harvard Law School. She's also the, the faculty co-director of the Criminal Justice Policy Program at Harvard Law School, and he's the author of, of numerous works um, on um, not only the death penalty, criminal law, and criminal procedure more generally. To her right is not her husband, but her brother. Uh, I like to think of them as a family of underachievers. Uh, and um, Jordan Steiker is the uh, Judge Robert M. Parker Endowed Chair in Law and Director of the Capital Punishment Center at the University of Texas uh, School of Law. Uh, he's also the author of numerous uh, publications besides the book that we are going to discuss today and again not only the death penalty space but on criminal law and criminal justice more general, uh, generally. Then we have two commentators, uh, Elizabeth Dahlstrom, uh, who is the Supervising Deputy Federal Public Defender here uh, in Los Angeles with lots of practical experience about capital litigation. So we are very excited to have her here with us. And last but not least, our own distinguished professor, Cheryl Thaxon, uh, who many of you know, um, who has been here at UCLA since 2013, who still appears as assistant professor of law at our website, but you know, we, his, we voted for his tenure recently, and I'm very excited, you know, about this. This is another way to celebrate to celebrate today. So we are going to structure this uh, event in the following way: we'll have the authors of the book first presenting the main ideas of the book in about 20 minutes, then each of the commentators will have about 15 minutes each, then uh, authors of the book uh, may reply anything they want regarding or react in any, any way they want regarding uh, the comments, and then we'll open it for your questions and comments. So without further ado, I turn it over to Carol and Jordan Steck. Thank you so much, Maximo. Jordan and I are both delighted to be here and very grateful to Maximo Langer for setting up this event and to Elizabeth Dahlstrom and Sherrod Baxton for commenting on our book. So we're going to share about 20 minutes um, to just introduce you to what this book is about. As the title suggests, Courting Death, the Supreme Court and Capital Punishment, the book is about the Supreme Court and Capital Punishment. It's about the mostly about the last 50 years of constitutional regulation of capital punishment. Now, most people, um, when they think about what's interesting or distinctive about the American death penalty, they immediately think what's distinctive or most distinctive is that we still have it. We are the only Western democracy that still retains the death penalty. And that's certainly a true distinction about uh, the American death penalty. In fact, not only do we retain it, we are among the handful of top executors in the world, along with China, Iran, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia, not our usual club. So it's absolutely true that the US is distinctive in this way in retaining the death penalty. 
But the one central, really this central argument of our book is that what is most distinctive about the American death penalty, what is really unique in the world about the American death penalty, is that we are the only country to have not merely retained the death penalty, like China or Saudi Arabia, or merely abolished the death penalty, like England or France. We're the only country to have subjected it to intensive top-down regulation through the courts. So we've attempted to reform and rationalize the system of capital justice um, through intensive legal regulation, constitutional regulation, from the US Supreme Court on down. Um, now, this project of constitutional regulation, which is a project of roughly the last 40 to 50 years, is a relatively recent phenomenon in American history. It was not always thus. For most of American history, it wasn't thought that the Constitution had anything to say about the death penalty. After all, the Constitution mentions the death penalty several times in the founding document. It was practiced by all of the original 13 colonies. Uh, so constitutional regulation is a rather latecomer to the American death penalty. Uh, which is not to say that the death penalty was static from the time of the founding until the last 40 or 50 years when the Supreme Court got involved. Uh, there was a lot of change in death penalty practices. The list of crimes eligible for capital punishment narrowed considerably. Executions moved from local public squares to behind prison walls. Certainly methods of execution changed a lot. We started with hanging. Uh, some places used the firing squad, then the electric chair became very popular, then the uh, uh, gas chamber here in, in California that was used for many, many years, and now lethal injection. So that's, you know, those are other things that changed about the death penalty over the course of many decades, centuries even. But what was true about those changes, which is what's true about the death penalty in other countries, is those changes tended to be from the bottom up, they tended to be um, uh, legislative changes, and different states changed their laws in response to bottom up movements within their states or influences laterally from other states through normal legislative political means, not from top down federal judicial intervention. So, how did and why did the Supreme Court get involved uh, in this topic? And the answer has something to do with the ways in which the death penalty was different across the United States. We all know we're a federal system. And those changes that I described in the death penalty over the course of decades and centuries happened disproportionately in the northern and western and middle western parts of the country, and much later, if at all, in the south. And this is because the American death penalty has been entwined from its inception with issues of race and chattel slavery in the United States. So from the very earliest years, even when the US was you know, a colonial uh, holding, the southern states used the death penalty disproportionately compared to the southern colonies used it disproportionately um, in contrast to the rest of uh, the colonies. I was going to say the rest of the country weren't a country yet. Um, and the reason had to do with slavery. Slaves were not going to be um, deterred from violent crime by the threat of imprisonment. They were already imprisoned. And slave owners were terrified of violence by their slaves, of slave uprisings against them. In many parts of the South, slaves outnumbered their white masters. And the masters relied on interrorum punishments. Uh, and you can understand just how much slave, um, the death penalty was part of slave culture when you understand that when slaves were executed, their owners were reimbursed by the state, just the way in which if your property is taken to make a highway today, the owners get reimbursed. It's a taking of property by the state for the public good. The executing of slaves in the southern states was treated in exactly the same way. It was understood to be an important part of the functioning of the slave system. And when you look at the antebellum use of the death penalty in the South, 
there were many, many, many more crimes that were eligible for execution um, by slaves than by whites. For example, in South Carolina, it was a crime to maim or even to bruise a white person. It was a capital crime. In the state of Virginia, there were 66 capital crimes that could be committed by slaves. There were only four that uh, free whites could be executed for. Now you might think, well, maybe that all ended with the end of the Civil War. And the answer was, no, it didn't end. It was no longer after the passage of the post-Civil War amendments possible to have, as we did before the Civil War, explicitly race-based capital punishments for blacks versus whites. But nonetheless, um, the, the death penalty was used disproportionately for black defendants in the South. The, a lot of whites in the South were terrified of the newly freed black population. They feared revenge and they feared violence on behalf of this population. And what the post-Civil War era led to was what one historian describes as an orgy of violence against the newly freed uh, population, black population in the South, an era of lynching. Uh, in fact, in the decade in which there were the most lynchings, the decade um, of uh, the last decade of the 19th century, the 1890s, there were considerably more <coughs> lynchings than there were legal executions throughout the country. And in fact, in the decades, uh, the couple of decades of the high, the high point, the heyday of lynchings, there were considerably more lynchings then than there were in the last 50 years of American history from today counting backwards, despite the fact that populations are much, much, much larger today than they were more than 100 years ago. So it gives you some scale of the lynching era. Now, how did the lynching era lead to the Supreme Court getting involved? Well, here's how. It turns out that lynchings were not popular among the leaders of southern states. It was many of the progressive leaders of southern states that were most in favor of the death penalty. They thought if they could have a, a system of swift and sure capital punishment for black men accused of violent crimes, especially rape against white women, then that would forestall lynching. And so in a lot of southern states, there developed a very disturbing practice of what some historians have called legal lynching. These would be trials that would be, you know, the mob that would in other circumstances be the lynch mob would be outside the courthouse and the sheriff would be on the front steps and says, just give us till nightfall, we'll have him executed by nightfall. And there would be these very slapdash trials with almost nothing that you would recognize as due process. And there'd be trial, conviction, sentence, and execution within a matter of hours. And this was considered actually progress from the lynching era, that uh, legal lynchings were a way of forestalling um, actual lynchings. But the Supreme Court took a somewhat dim view of this as word of these legal lynchings um, became widely known. And I'm just going to tell you very quickly two stories of the very first engagement of the Supreme Court with capital punishment. So one story comes from Tennessee in 1906. A man named Ed Johnson was accused, black man named Ed Johnson was accused of raping a white woman, not killing her, raping her. He was charged and it was one of these legal lynchings, the mob was outside the courtroom uh, calling for blood. It was an incredibly flimsy case. The victim of the rape and the sole witness to the crime testified on the stand, I cannot swear he is the man, Nonetheless, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, the case on appeal got the attention of the U.S. Supreme Court. And Justice John Marshall Harlan I, this is the same Justice John Marshall Harlan who was the dissenter, the famous dissenter in Plessy versus Ferguson 10 years previously, um, the case that later was overturned by Brown versus Board of Education. He was the circuit justice for that. Uh, covered Tennessee, and he noted the court's probable jurisdiction. He wanted the court to grant habeas review of the case. The day after Justice um, Harlan's order, um, noting probable jurisdiction, a lynch mob led by local officials, including a deputy sheriff, went and kidnapped Ed Johnson from his jail cell, took him to a bridge spanning the Tennessee River, and hanged him and shot him more than 50 times 
Five of those shots were at point blank range by the deputy sheriff, who left a note pinned to Ed Johnson's body, which said, Justice Harlan, come get your N word now. So that was the court's very first engagement with trying to address the problem of legal lynchings in the South. And it showed how fragile federal authority was at that time, it was in 1906 um, in Tennessee. Well, fast forward to the early 1930s. Lynchings had died down. Federal authority had gotten a little bit stronger. And there was a case, in this case you probably are familiar with, a case called Powell versus Alabama, otherwise known as the Scottsboro Boys case. And in nine black, well, a lot of people say nine black men, but in fact they were actually boys. Like the boys was probably a derogatory word for black men, but in this case it was accurate. All of them were between the ages of 12 and 19. So these nine black teenagers were charged um, with raping two white women in a rail car in which all of them were sort of riding kind of hobo riding the, the rails and the women accused the men of raping them. The youngest one, who was like 12 at the time, did not get the death penalty. The other eight got the death penalty after incredibly truncated trials based on very flimsy evidence. Eventually, the state of Alabama, eventually, 80 some odd years later, issued official pardons, most of them posthumous, to all of the Scottsboro boys. But the US Supreme Court, in, in, eight, in 1932, took the case up and made its very first constitutional ruling explicitly addressing capital punishment. And it said, in capital cases, as opposed to all other criminal cases, um, defendants had a right to be represented by counsel. And if they didn't have such a right, which the Scots Row Boys essentially did not, um, that was a violation of due process. So that, that ruling, um, that which would not, would not be extended to all of so most other serious criminal cases until Gideon versus Rainwright, 30 some odd years later, 1963, uh, that ruling was a shot across the bow for the American death penalty. It was the beginning of the story that then picks up where Jordan will pick it up. So 1963 really is the year that marks the beginning of the modern death penalty. Um, in a case that was an eerie echo of the Scottsboro Boys case, uh, Rudolph versus Alabama, an African American man was convicted and sentenced to death for the rape of a white woman, and he filed a cert petition in the Supreme Court. The case was extremely important, even though the Supreme Court declined to hear it. The Supreme Court um, de denied cert in the case, um, but Justice Goldberg wrote a dissent from denial of cert, um, raising the question that wasn't really raised in the briefs at all, whether the death penalty is excessive as applied to the crime of rape. He had actually spent the summer looking for a case to be a vehicle to address the American death penalty. He was convinced that this might be a time where the court could take the initiative and address the constitutionality of the death penalty, even though there was literally no case in the American canon that had ever called into question the constitutionality of the death penalty. He got his law clerk, who was Alan Dershowitz, to write him a memo outlining the best arguments that were available for restricting the death penalty. And Dershowitz's memo said, I'm not sure there's a strong doctrinal or constitutional case for finding the death penalty as a punishment unconstitutional, but it is undoubtedly a problem in terms of its racially discriminatory administration. And so Goldberg wrote a dissent from denial in which he said maybe the death penalty is disproportionate for rape. He, caught, he drew attention to the fact that the only people who had been executed for rape in Alabama had been African American inmates convicted of raping white victims. Um, Chief Justice Warren, when he saw this dissent from denial of cert, said, can you please remove the references to race, which Justice Goldberg did. So the opinion that he wrote, which was a very short opinion, just said, um, this might be excessive punishment for the crime. Uh, it turns out that the audience for that memo was the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which had always regarded the death penalty as an issue of racial justice. 
and seeing that the Supreme, that at least three members on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Goldberg was joined by two other justices, that three members of the Supreme Court were interested in this issue made them think that maybe the time was right to attack the American death penalty. And they developed an extraordinarily ambitious strategy of trying to achieve a moratorium on executions. Executions had already been in decline from the 1930s and in a significant decline beginning in the early 1960s. And they thought if they could bring executions to a halt in the United States, then eventually the United States would abandon the death penalty. And they decided to raise an, every constitutional claim they could in the, for those people who were on death row, some, of, some claims that were death penalty specific claims about the way in which the death penalty was administered in the country. Others were sort of the newly emerging constitutional rights that the Warren Court was recognizing in the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment area. And the most remarkable thing about this strategy is that it, that it worked. That executions ground to a halt in this country in 1967. We went for a decade without executions. Um, the Legal Defense Fund coordinated litigation raising all kinds of constitutional challenges to the American death penalty. And in 1972, the Supreme Court struck down all prevailing capital statutes under the Eighth Amendment. When that decision was announced, most people, certainly the members of the Supreme Court who were in the majority, um, thought that that was the end of the American death penalty. The headlines of the New York Times the next day were as big and as bold in declaring that the death penalty had been struck down as when three years earlier man had landed on the moon, and that was the headline in the New York Times. Um, it turns out, though, that the decision was more fragile than the justice had expected, and maybe they should have expected it to be fragile. When the Supreme Court issued its ruling, it didn't declare that the death penalty was a violation of human dignity. Um, there were five justices in the majority. All of them wrote separate opinions. All of them had different reasoning underlying their opinion. Only two of them thought that the death penalty as a punishment was unconstitutional, Justices Brennan and Marshall. The rest of the justices pointed out um, the, the arbitrary administration of the death penalty, the way in which the rarity of, of the death penalty was undermining the purposes of capital punishment and made the punishment excessive. And the, the opinion generated tremendous backlash, um, partly because this was happening at the same time of rising crime. It was also at a time when the Supreme Court was particularly fragile with busing decisions, and, um, and 35 states quickly reenacted new death penalty statutes, and four years later, the Supreme Court, really in the only case that has directly addressed the question, held that the death penalty is a permissible punishment, that states can use the death penalty for retributive and deterrence purposes, and that nothing in the Constitution is offended by the death penalty as a punishment. But the Supreme Court, in its decisions, called out certain practices that states had embarked upon and started to create this elaborate regulatory framework for how the death penalty should be administered. And basically, for the last 40 some odd years, 42 years, um, we've lived with the Supreme Court's regulation of the death penalty. And what our book tries to do is tries to sort of trace out the consequences of that 40-year project of constitutional regulation. And we really make two arguments in the book. We make an argument, well, we make a lot of arguments. We make two arguments about the, 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 the effects of constitutional regulation. Um, in the first couple decades of the Supreme Court's regulation, we argue that the constitutional regulation helped stabilize and legitimate the American death penalty. Um, we look closely at the various doctrines that the Supreme Court promulgated, and we, we conclude that they actually demanded very little of states. They don't really intrusively regulate. But nonetheless, um, they caused a lot of disruption in the way in which states administered the death penalty because of the difficulty of translation and communication between the courts and states and legislatures. Um, 
But by legitimate, our argument is that because the Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to the American death penalty, um, it made the actors both within the American criminal justice system and the death penalty system and outside of the criminal justice system much more comfortable than they would have been or should have been with the way in which the death penalty was practiced in the United States. And so ironically, the Supreme Court entering into the fray led to or contributed to the ratcheting up of death sentences and executions. The, de the death penalty was an, in tremendous decline when the Supreme Court got into this field in the 1960s and early 1970s, but within a decade or two of the Supreme Court's decisions, uh, executions climbed to close to 100 a year in the late 1990s. Death sentencing reached its highs of in the, uh, over 300 a year nationwide uh, in the mid-1990s. And, and we argue that the constitutional regulation facilitated and stabilized the death penalty that might have run its course had it not become such a visible and um, polarizing issue because of the Supreme Court's intervention. We argue, though, that even though mm. the first two decades were ones of stabilization and entrenchment, the last two decades of the American death penalty, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the last two decades have seen a dramatic decline and withering of the American death penalty. Um, just in terms of sheer numbers, death sentencing has dropped off the cliff. We now have um, a 90% drop from the highs in the 1990s of 300 death sentences a year nationwide to the last couple of years of we've had about 30 death sentences nationwide. Um, executions have likewise dropped off the cliff down to about 20 or so executions nationwide. And we argue that constitutional regulation has actually contributed significantly, even though we, can, we still believe that constitutional regulation is pretty minimal in its actual demands uh, of what states must do to have a constitutional system. So how does regulation, how has regulation contributed to the decline? Well, regulation has basically caused the creation of all kinds of institutional structures that didn't exist, that have made it much more difficult to actually have death sentences and executions and much more expensive to have both. So in the 1960s, um, there was no such thing as full-time death penalty lawyers. They didn't exist. There were no such things as mitigation specialists. It's a profession that emerged in the 1990s. Most states didn't have much in the way of demanding systems of review or post-conviction review. If you were sentenced to death, you weren't entitled to a lawyer in most jurisdictions for state habeas or federal habeas. But the existence of a new constitutional framework and new constitutional rights contributed to the growth of these structures, which meant that death sentences were going to be administered much longer after the uh, actual imposition of the sentence. Executions were going to take much more time. Um, trials were going to be much more expensive because there was now a whole cadre of lawyers with specialized training in how to do death penalty work. And, um, if there's any place to, to make the point, California is the point. Um, in California, we've had all kinds of institutional actors who didn't exist before to support death penalty defendants. And it's become extremely difficult to have executions in California because the, just the mere fact of regulation means that there are so many points at which executions can be frustrated. You need tremendous coordination between district attorneys, attorney generals, state courts, federal courts, in order to consummate death sentences with executions. Um, so the cost of the death penalty in California is often illustrated by just looking at how much the death penalty has cost per execution, because California is a jurisdiction that's only had about a dozen executions over the last 40 years. And if you add up the, the extra cost because of the death penalty, beyond the cost that it would be that would be exacted for sentencing people to life without possibility of parole. The actual cost per execution in California is about a quarter of a billion dollars, about $250 million um, per execution. And so 
this has led to a lot of destabilization. A lot of, um, a lot of states have revisited the death penalty, not for the reasons that our European allies had. Our European allies have made it a point of sort of, um, sort of personal identity to be opposed to the death penalty for human dignity grounds. But in the United States, most of the opposition of the death penalty and what's led many states, six states in the last 15 years to abandon the death penalty, um, are pragmatic concerns, that it's too expensive, that it takes too much time in order to consummate death sentences with executions, that it can't possibly serve as a deterrent under these circumstances. Um, so the growth of the of constitutional regulation has really impeded the death penalty on the ground. And one of the way in which we frame the argument is that really we have regulated the death penalty to death. Um, not because we've asked states to do so much, but because when an institution like the Supreme Court promulgates rules and creates an area and space of regulation that didn't exist before, that that creates new kinds of challenges in ways that were not foreseen and which have ultimately, I think, set the stage for the possible abolition of the death penalty uh, in the United States. And we make an argument that the, that the court's doctrines actually create the possibility of judicial abolition because of the ways in which, on the ground, in practice, uh, it becomes so much more difficult to have death sentences and execution. Thank you both. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm a death penalty practitioner full time. I work at the Federal Public Defender's Office and we specialize in uh, federal capital habeas, which is the third and final stage of death penalty appeals. I tend to live uh, my life very close to the death penalty through my individual clients. And so um, I really appreciate books like Courting Death that give me a broader perspective, a national perspective and historical perspective that you can't really get through working on individual cases. So thank you for that. Um, the book starts with Judge Carney's 2014 decision declaring the death penalty unconstitutional in California. And um, that's where I live. I live in the federal courthouse in Orange County. It's, um, Judge Carney's chambers are just a couple floors above me. And when that decision came out, um, none of us who practice in Orange County were particularly surprised by it. Um, although Judge Carney's a Republican, he's much more principled than partisan. So that wasn't a surprise. And nothing he said about the death penalty in California was a surprise to us either, because those of us who practice there are very familiar with the delay and dysfunction that exists in the California death penalty system. And so I'd like to spend some time talking about what it's like to actually practice there. First of all, it requires lawyers like me to see the future. And what I mean by that is that I know that claims that I allege today may not get decided for a decade or more. Just by way of example, the first capital petition I ever filed um, was when I was 27 years old. I was three years out of law school. Um, and uh, it was a different world back then. It was a long time ago. And now I'm almost 40, and it was just denied last week. <laughs> so that's. And, and that makes it hard because there's also <coughs> lots of procedural rules that make it hard for me to add claims later or after I file. So I have to think about what um, possible facts and theories uh, exist today or may develop um, into a possibility of relief for my client. For example, right now the Supreme Court has outlawed the death penalty for juveniles up to age 18 based on brain science that shows that the juvenile brain is not fully developed. Well, uh, many scientists say that uh, that process actually continues to 20 or possibly even 25. So if I have a client who's 20, 19, um, I need to allege that claim today because there is a possibility that when my case gets decided 10 or 12 or 15 years from now, the Supreme Court will have announced that rule and I need it to apply to my case. <coughs> and there are many other areas of law that are like that. For example, we believe that the next possibility um, 
next category, people who may be excluded from the death penalty, are those with severe mental illness. Well, that covers a lot of my clients, most of them, I would say. And so I need to allege that claim as well, even though um, it's not fully developed yet. We also um, allege many systemic claims based on the body of regulations that are discussed in the book. So, for example, um, despite the fact that the Supreme Court has announced uh, or required certain procedures, uh, California does not require any <coughs> burden of proof or standard of proof in a penalty phase trial. So, in a guilt phase trial, the government has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. But in the penalty phase, which is arguably the most important legal proceeding that exists, it's the height of government power. It's the government able to take the lives of its citizens. The government isn't obligated to prove anything in particular by any particular standard. The jury is told to weigh the aggravators and the mitigators and make a moral reason decision. And we object to that in every case. So all of these claims uh, that I need to allege now, because of the delay, lead to some very long petitions, maybe five, seven hundred pages long. They're often supported by thousands of pages of exhibits, um, social service records, declarations from people who knew my client growing up, declarations from experts, um, and that's all included in our petitions, which, of course, also contributes to the amount of time it takes to resolve cases. Second, the delay complicates my relationships with my clients. Because just as I'm getting older, they're getting older too. By the time they come to me in federal habeas, the average client, I would say, is in his 50s. But we have many clients who are in their 60s or even 70s. And there are a growing number of men and women on death row who are suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's, and other age-related neurocognitive disorders. We have a number of men who have suffered strokes and who can no longer communicate. And that complicates my relationships with my clients because it impacts my ability to communicate with them. I can't talk to them about their case. They can't tell me their life story. They can't give me the names of witnesses that I need. I can't have them evaluated by an expert. You can't really do an IQ test on somebody who can't speak. It's very difficult. Um, and so, and all of that has not really been addressed by the Supreme Court either, how these, these age-related disorders may impact um, the ability to execute somebody who's very elderly, although the Supreme Court recently granted cert on a case uh, where that issue may be addressed. Now, the ones of my clients who aren't incapacitated are frustrated. <laughs> um, it's not always true that death penalty um, inmates just want delay. Most of them want their day in court, and many of them have righteous guilt phase claims or claims of innocence, and they get tired of waiting too. Um, and in fact, we have this somewhat unique phenomenon in California that practitioners have to deal with of clients wanting to waive penalty. Now, they're not volunteering for execution. They're not saying, I want to drop all my appeals and be executed. But what they're saying is, I am tired of waiting, and I want to write a letter to the judge, usually, uh, and say, get rid of my penalty phase claims. Just focus on my guilt phase claims, because I want my retrial. And the reason is, their witnesses are dying. Their uh, memories are fading, and they are, they are starting to feel like I'm never going to get my day in court. My case is never going to get resolved. Um, perhaps, though, the most frustrating part about practicing uh, in California is what you get at the end of all this delay, and that is usually what's called a summary denial. It's sometimes called a postcard denial because it can fit on a postcard. It's a one paragraph, sometimes a one sentence order that says, petition has been denied. Sometimes they add on the merits. So, <laughs> we wait 10 years for seven words, sometimes. And that's also very difficult to explain to my clients because it cites no law, makes no factual findings, and was made without any court hearings, no oral arguments even. Um, and, that, and that can be very hard for clients to understand. Um, it's also frustrating because capital habeas petitions are not like appeals where the, the issues are record-based and you expect them to be uh, resolved on the paper. What a habeas petition really is, is an initiation of a lawsuit. And we almost always need a hearing and fact development and discovery in order to prove our claims up. And so when the California Supreme Court issues a summary denial, what it is telling us 
is not one of your claims made out a prima facie case for relief. You don't get an order to show cause. You don't get discovery or an evidentiary hearing. And that is, that's got to be the most frustrating part. Um, that one sentence order is what we take into federal court. And um, the book talks about, in chapters four and chapter nine, about the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act and how it decimated federal habeas review. I'm going to spend a little more time talking about it because that's where I live. I live and breathe the ADPA every day. And it's hard to overstate the harshness of this law and what it did. Uh, it is not designed to make capital punishment more trustworthy, more dependent, uh, reliable. It is designed simply to speed up executions. And frankly, it hasn't done that great of a job at doing it, at least in California. The text of the law says that Federal courts can't grant relief unless the state court decision was contrary to or an unreasonable application of clearly established federal law. What that did, what it means, is that there is a class now of constitutional error that federal courts can't remedy. There is a space between um, the Constitution has been violated, but not unreasonably so. And we have a number of clients who have fallen into that space where we have a federal court saying, the Constitution has been violated. I would remedy this, but I can't because the ADPA prevents me from doing that. Now, the text of the law is bad enough, but what makes it even more difficult is that the Supreme Court has also heavily policed the interpretation of the ADPA. Um, there's decision, and they did police it in a way that wipes out the benefit of any sort of substantive regulation. Um, designed to make capital punishment more fair. So, for example, uh, in 2011, there was a decision um, called Harrington versus Richter. And uh, what Richter said is that those one uh, sentence or one paragraph orders that I get from the California Supreme Court are subject to the ADPA. And you might ask yourself, well, how can how can a how can you show that something's an unreasonable application of Supreme Court law when they didn't cite any law. I ask myself that every day. <laughs> uh, what the court said is, um, well, you need to rebut all possible reasons. And it's a psychologically impossible task. Um, and it makes it very, very difficult to win. And Richter was simply one of many Supreme Court decisions that affect how federal habeas works. Other ones, um, there was another one, uh, Mail v. Felix, which made it very difficult to add new claims later. And there was another one called Pinholster that um, says that everything that a federal court can look at has to have gone through the state court system first. And this is different than the regular doctrine of exhaustion where you're required to, you know, um, submit your legal theory and your basic facts. Pinholster created basically a super exhaustion requirement that now requires me to put every piece of paper back in front of the California Supreme Court for another go around. And of course, that also increases delay. Now, if a petitioner was able to navigate all of that and could get relief, there's also a very good chance that the Supreme Court is gonna take it away. Uh, the Supreme Court has summarily reversed grants of relief under the ADPA very frequently in years, especially from the Ninth Circuit. It seems, it seems that they like to start the term out with a summary reversal from the Ninth Circuit. That's, that's been the case for a couple years. So at the end of the day, my perspective as a practitioner is that excessive delay plus summary denials plus ADPA review means that capital defendants in California really don't get meaningful review of their convictions at all. Now, some people say, well, we should just speed things up. Certainly the voters of the state of California said that last November. Um, and I occasionally hear people say we should be more like Texas or Virginia. And so I was particularly interested in your chapter on the difference between symbolic states like California and executing states like Virginia. but. I have a personal experience um, that I'll share on the distinction between those two cases because I had a, a case that involved both of them at the same time. Uh, my client, Alfredo Prieto, was on death row in California uh, in 1992. Um, 
he went through the appellate process and came to me in 2007 for the preparation of his federal habeas petition. We realized pretty early on that he had an Atkins claim, which is a claim of intellectual disability, which would make him completely ineligible for the death penalty. At the time we were preparing his federal petition in California, he was extradited to Virginia to stand trial for a murder there. We prepared his petition the best we could, given that we didn't have uh, access to him when in Virginia jail, and we submitted it to the California Supreme Court. And it sat there for the next seven years. And in that time, he was tried three times in Virginia. His conviction was reversed twice. It went that fast. And uh, he did have some uh, evidence of intellectual disability presented in his Virginia trial. But Virginia at the time had a rule uh, that a test score over 70, an IQ test score over 70, meant you weren't intellectually disabled. And the jury was instructed on that. Well, my client had several scores under 70, some in the 60s, but he had one that was a 73. So the jury found him not intellectually disabled and sentenced him to death for the final time in Virginia. After that happened, uh, the Supreme Court decided Hall v. Florida, which said states can't do that, that they cannot impose a strict IQ cutoff. Um, and based on that decision, we filed another petition in California. He attempted to raise it in federal habeas review in Virginia, and the Virginia courts found it defaulted. And the Fourth Circuit found it defaulted. And mean, in the meantime, our California case continued to pend. We filed motion after motion for them to expedite their decision. Um, we asked the Supreme Court to intervene, and in the end, nobody intervened. And he was executed in October of 2015 without ever having received a fair Atkins hearing in either state, either symbolic or executing. So my experience is that uh, the death penalty is irrevocably broken in this country, that it can't be fixed by speeding things up or by further regulation. I do believe abolition will come and that it will come in my lifetime. I worry that it won't come soon enough for some of my clients. So in the meantime, I encourage those of you that are students to join us in the fight um, against capital punishment. The death penalty is not dead. It's not dead in California. Um, in fact, as we speak, they just published the final regulations for a new lethal injection protocol. And we have 21 people who are in danger of being executed again in California. So if you're inclined, please join us. As for the professors and academics here, um, I ask you to please keep writing. And please send me what you write. <laughs> uh, because I read Courting Death when it first came out, before I had any idea that I would ever be lucky enough to meet the authors. And every single one of these yellow tabs is a note, a thought, an argument that I thought might be able to help one of my clients, that I thought maybe I could mention this in a brief or cite this. And so I thank you for writing. Your writing matters to practitioners, and I thank you all for having me here today. Thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, I turn it, now, we turn it now to Professor Thaxon. Okay. Uh, <coughs> should I move the mic a little closer? So first, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the familiar faces of my students taking criminal adjudication and capital punishment. Uh, very happy that you were able to make it. Uh, and also, I want to strongly encourage you to uh, participate in the Q&A and ask plenty of questions uh, at this event. And so I'll try to do my best to keep my uh, remarks uh, brief to allow sufficient time uh, for that. <coughs> Obviously, you are in my class, so you know I could uh, get off topic sometimes. So what that means is I will be s uh, keeping remarks brief, but doing that by trying to stick uh, to the script. Um, second, I'd definitely like to thank Carolyn Jordan uh, for writing what I honestly believe is uh, an incredible and extremely helpful uh, book. I think it fills a very important gap in the literature because it can operate both as a trade book, you know, a book for a general audience, but also a more academically uh, focused book as well that is suited, well suited for classes not only in law school but also in history departments, sociology, uh, many other disciplines, um, just to name a few. Uh, and again, that's very helpful and just like Elizabeth, I wish I had this book when I was a young federal defender in a similar office that, that Elizabeth works in, but just in Sacramento, would have been extremely helpful in providing that synthesis, because you're right, just a step back. And so, uh, Luckily, you're still in the office and you have the book, and so and I'm mad at you for not writing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. All right. So there is again so much to like about your book, uh, and so my comments that are admittedly going to be brief are going to be maybe focused more on issues of, uh, of emphasis and interpretation rather than any kind of penetrating a critique. But listening to Elizabeth, I think I'm not going to start off where I wanted to start off, and maybe think more about um, kind of my, some California-focused uh, remarks, and hopefully I think that will be more useful to the room as well. Um, so let me get there first. All right. Um, so Elizabeth did discuss very eloquently and powerfully um, the, the challenges, the real challenges of uh, representing uh, condemned uh, clients, uh, particularly at you know, the appellate level, state post-conviction, and also federal post-conviction. And so um, I'm obviously familiar with that, and uh, personally familiar with that. And while reading uh, your book, uh, Carol Jordan, I was running to the infamous line from uh, Dick the Butcher and Shakespeare's Henry the Sixth that many of us uh, are familiar with, which is the first thing we do, let's kill all of the lawyers. Now that's often been misinterpreted as an indictment of unethical lawyers, unscrupulous lawyers, uh, but now there's a growing uh, consensus that actually what that phrase meant was that killing the lawyers was important to undermining the rule of law. And when you mention in your book about a representation crisis, uh, I want to highlight some things that, and this is again by a point about emphasis, that I think maybe could have been emphasized more in the book. Not that you don't discuss it, but I think that's very important, particularly when we think about this moment in, uh, in California. Okay, um, so what we are experiencing now um, in California are efforts through both the uh, Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act that uh, uh, Elizabeth mentioned, uh, its opt-in provision, and I'll talk a little more about that, and through Proposition 66, uh, which was approved through a uh, state uh, initiative, ballot initiative, to move cases more quickly through uh, the appellate process, right? And also, on a substantive level, making it harder for petitioners to win on the merits. All right, um, what's particularly troubling about both of these uh, issues, again, EDPA's opt-in and Proposition 66, uh, is the role that non-judicial branches, Congress, the right, Department of Justice, also the general public in California, have played in trying to shape the state's capital defense <coughs> function. Uh, initially, federal courts were left to decide whether states established procedures to appoint competent counsel and provide reasonable uh, resources necessary to permit expedited and more deferential uh, post-conviction review, appellate review. Um, and under that system, again, that was policed by courts, uh, none of the states that sought to be certified to benefit from these expedited procedures of part of the uh, part of EDPA, um, uh, none of those states that sought certification were certified. And again, often Ed, um, opt-in is also called a fast-track uh, provision. So, but now Congress then takes away the power uh, from the courts to police and gave it to the Department of Justice. So you take the power of the courts that, again, or police opt in, which has a lot to do, and I'll speak more with, um, again, the proper appointment of counsel, the resources that defense counsel has, and their level of competency to represent uh, uh, defendants who have been charged and, and convicted uh, of the death penalty, and puts that power in the DOJ, the U.S. Attorney General. Now, hopefully I'm not the only one that finds that pretty problematic. Okay, we think of what they call fox guarding the hen house, right? Um, and uh, not only did it take uh, the power from federal courts and give it to the Department of Justice, uh, it also eliminated, um, it should be limited the federal courts' um, review of the regulations, the rules now that would come out of the Department of Justice just to uh, the D.C. Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit, and also in limited the scope of that court's review. Right. Now, the new rules established by the Department of Justice have been heavily criticized by both the American Bar Association and other organizations for essentially allowing states to speed up an already broken system right, by shortening the statute of limitations for federal post-conviction review. Um, not only that, not just in terms of getting cases to, uh, to the federal uh, courts, uh, but also the, the length of time that federal courts have to decide a uh, rule on these issues. Okay. So again, the, 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 um, the power of courts to engage in corrective measures have been greatly uh, curtailed. And these new rules promulgated by the Department of Justice uh, 
don't provide even enough specificity with respect to the appointment of counsel compensation standard of competency, right? So not enough notice and even opportunity for comment and also any type of um, uh, really influence or interaction from uh, the uh, sufficient, should I say, um, opportunity from the Capital uh, Defense Bar to challenge the state procedures. Um, now, state post-conviction attorneys sued uh, the Department of Justice under, and I won't get to technical details, but under the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, basically uh, arguing that the DOJ didn't follow kind of proper procedure and promulgating the regulations, and initially got an injunction uh, because of the lack of transparency from the DOJ uh, concerning, again, the standards and evidence that would be used to make certification for fast-tracking uh, the appellate uh, review. Um, uh, what would this actually entail? All right. Uh, so this meant that defense agencies couldn't really meaningfully determine how to allocate resources and advise their clients, all right? Uh, because they didn't really know about the litigation contingencies that come to pass. Again, lack of transparency here. Again, the initial injunction was granted um, after a federal trial judge said, yeah, these regulations are arbitrary and capricious in several respects. But that injunction was then vacated uh, by the federal appellate court because the issue wasn't ripe. And basically, the argument behind that is, well, no state has been certified. And so because no state has been certified, yet, um, again, the claim is not right for the court to hear. All right. Um, but I just want to try to give some meat to this so you understand what's at stake. All right. So we think about fast tracking. What does this really mean? What's happening on the ground? Right? It reduces the time that a petitioner has to file a federal petition from one year, which is not a lot of time, to six months after the final date of judgment in state courts on direct appeal. Okay? Again, a year's definitely not enough, so they're cutting that in half. Right? Also, federal courts have to give right, priority um, to uh, these uh, capital cases and resolve it within time limits specified under this fast track provision. All right? So district courts must decide the petition within 180 days, court of appeals must decide the petition within 120 days, it makes it more difficult to amend petitions, which is so important because as Elizabeth said, at this point you, you're, you're guessing about what needs to go on the petition. Okay? And I'm making it prevents the courts from reviewing uh, specific claims. Now that is the ADPA, that's EDPA, that's federal. Let's talk about the state. Let's talk about Proposition 66, how it's tried to expedite, and we'll talk about some litigation uh, about this as well, but how it's going to try to expedite again an already broken system. So under Proposition 66, and just to say the language of the proposition stuff is just very, very confusing. Right, so you know it's bad and you can't even really understand what the actual, and am I wrong here? It's hard to understand what actually the reform uh, entails. Uh, but, you know, presiding, uh, judge presiding over a trial, the actual capital trial, would be forced to hear uh, uh, the state habeas case, the state post-conviction case. And again, there's some exceptions, again, if the judge can be removed for, for certain reasons. But uh, again, this is an expert, too. I mean, uh, uh, this was uh, intended to expedite uh, the process here. We can think about problems about having a judge who presided over the trial now to correct trial error that that judge may have let actually occur in the case. Again, I uh, hope it's not just me that I think this is it's pretty crazy, okay? Um, right, it's changed um, in order to try to expedite the appellate process. Uh, petitions would be appealed to the California Inter Intermediate Appellate Court and then the, uh, the California Supreme Court, which wasn't the case uh, before. Uh, Here's the real thing, and I want to talk about some litigation. Okay, I'm good on time. Um, state appeals and the habeas process, so the entire um, direct and post-conviction review uh, at the state, uh, was to be completed within five years, okay? Five years of the imposition of the death sentence. Now, this was challenged, and fortunately, uh, the California Supreme Court, Court basically rewrote the initiative calling that this five-year requirement was a directive rather than mandatory deadline. Although there were two dissenting uh, dissenting justices, this was a 5-2 uh, opinion, who said, well, actually, we should just rule the proposition unconstitutional. So the court salvages the through it becoming basically something acting as if it's the legislature there. Now, it's important we think about this five-year directive, even if it isn't a, a mandate, 
because typically the process can take 20 years. Okay. Um, it's also important to know that it, it has well, how long time? Okay, I want to speed up. Trial courts, rather than the California Supreme Court, uh, would appoint uh, attorneys for state habeas petition. It limits on successive petitions. Interesting thing here when we think about competency to represent uh, capital defendants. Uh, the proposition required the attorneys who take non capital appeals to now take capital appeals, right? Really respective of the qualifications to take that case. And then lastly, defense counsel must file a petition within one year of uh, appointment to the case. So again, an effort to speed up an already broken process. And it reminds me of thinking about medical malpractice. Oftentimes doctors want to get in and try to fix whatever they might have messed up before before there's a clear uh, analysis and inquiry into what was the initial uh, mistake. And there's more specificity, but I won't uh, get into that. But I do want to say one thing about uh, Proposition 66. Almost every major newspaper editorial board opposed Proposition 66. This includes the LA Times, the San Jose Mercury News, the Sacramento Bee, San Diego Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, Orange County Register, because it was apparent that this was just an attempt to, again, expedite an already broken uh, system. And uh, now current UC, uh, UC Berkeley Law Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, who was the Dean at UC Irvine, noted uh, at the time the California Supreme Court heard the challenge to Proposition 66. And again, the court rewrites uh, the uh, five-year mandate to a directive. Uh, there were 50 capital defendants who didn't have lawyers for direct appeal and 360 that didn't have lawyers for state habeas. Right? And half of those 360 had been waiting for nearly a decade. So again, when we go back to the first thing we do is we need to kill all the lawyers. You have to understand why I might not be as optimistic about the ultimate um, definitely abolition because now perhaps the approach is now attacking the actual, the true, uh, the shield that uh, capital defense terms uh, that function they provide. Okay. Thank you so much for the point. Presentations. I don't know, Jordan, how you want to say? We want to turn okay. it over to the audience. So why don't we open it to you, comments, questions from the audience? Um, I have a question for you. I was wondering what you say to, or how you advise your clients who want to waive their um, sentencing petitions. Uh, I always encourage them not to do that. Um, I and I understand. I tr I try to understand. It's coming from an emotional place. They're getting frustrated with the delay, and so um, it's almost never in their best interest to let go of those claims. That one penalty claim that doesn't look so good now might be the one that saves their life ten years from now. So I, I try to work with them. I try to find uh, ways to meet their needs in other ways. If, if maybe we can find a motion, we can file some discovery, uh, something to keep them on board with um, all the claims that I've alleged. Um, I wanted to know why it takes so long, like 15 to 20 years, for an execution to happen. Is it because of the appeals and all of the motions that happen during the case? <coughs> or, yeah, why does it In California, um, <coughs> Our, our briefs are long, but I want to be clear that the delay came first. <laughs> that uh, California has simply put way too many people on death row. And part of the reason they were able to do that is there are so many um, special circumstances in California. The voters expanded the kind of crimes that can get the death penalty um, so broadly that almost every murder now qualifies. And that gives lots of discretion to DAs in places like Orange County, Riverside, Los Angeles County um, to charge these cases as death penalty cases. And they may pay for the trial, but they don't pay for the appeal. So that's how we end up with hundreds and hundreds of people on death row um, without any state funding um, and not any more judges to handle all of the petitions. <laughs> okay. I have two Barbados here. <laughs> Which one should come first? You know? can't come on. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, um, 
So for you two with your book, you were talking about the sort of um, pragmatic approaches to like ending the death penalty and in Europe how it's more of like a morality and humanity aspect of it. And I was wondering if you think that by taking a more pragmatic approach, like how that might impact other movements and struggles that take a more humanity aspect, morality um, approach to abolition, whether it's like prison abolition, death penalty abolition, and how pragmatics might end up harming the overall movements. <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we say in our book, and, I, and you can tell me this is what you were about to say, isn't it? Um, is that after, you know, <laughs> one mind. <laughs> one of the things we say in the book is that, you know, if we also, like Elizabeth, think that constitutional abolition will occur. We hope it's in Elizabeth's lifetime. Um, if not, like, your lifetimes. Um, uh, but if it happens, it may well be um, propelled by these pr pragmatic uh, uh, reasons, but we think ultimately it will be, we will quickly recast it and remember it as being a moral and human rights, you know, uh, based decision, that Americans are very good at rewriting our history to make it look much more attractive than it is, and, and I think that that's a very likely thing to happen. So in this case, we may not end up paying a price, you know, for being pragmatic as opposed to moral, except that the price we might pay is not being true to our history, that if we end up doing it, it's not because we have some exceptional regard for human dignity or universal human rights. Um, but we may remember ourselves as having it, mm -hmm. as having such a thing. I would just add to that that I think that's actually the experience of a lot of nations that have abolished the death penalty. So in Europe, it's really been a, a carrot and a stick that if you want the economic integration to be part of the EU, you have to abolish the death penalty. And so I think there are a lot of countries that have actually come to abolition from that perspective, sort of wanting to be part of the economic integration. And yet now they probably understand their abolition in the way of well, we, we stand with those who believe that it's a violation of human rights and human dignity. So, uh, so it sounds like a terrific book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, I'm wondering uh, how the book is situated with respect to debates about backlash more generally. So um, there's a broad literature on this, it figures perhaps most salient with respect to Brown and Rowe. So how do you situate your project in light of that ongoing debate, which I sometimes find frustrating and don't know what to do with? So solve that problem for me. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that the book does situate itself there. There is an article that we drew on a little bit for the book um, that actually engages with that literature more. Like one of our biggest first interventions was a, a Harvard Law Review article that we wrote in 1995 called Sober Second Thoughts, um, Reflections on, 20, on Two Decades of Capital Pun of what, Reflections on Two Decades of Constitutional Regulation of Capital Punishment. And in that article, we have a section called Furman as Brown, Furman as Roe, oh, where we try to compare it to Brown and Roe and say there's something distinctive in terms of the possibilities of backlash with regard to capital punishment because unlike school desegregation and unlike um, abortion services, the conduct of capital punishment is happens in courts so that when courts do it, they can speak more authoritatively um, about the changes that they're uh, making than when they're trying to intervene in some other things that are m less outside their purview. And one of the things that we say in the book, which extends that argument, although we don't relate it to um, Brown and Roe, is that many people worry that if what we predict and what Elizabeth predicts will happen, that there will be a uh, constitutional abolition of capital punishment sometime, uh, relatively soon, whether that will engender yet another backlash, just like the original Furman did. And we think not, precisely because the Supreme Court has taken this 40-plus year 
mend it, don't end it approach. And they've tried all of these interventions to try to cure the um, pathologies of the capital justice system. And if, it, if they eventually abolish capital punishment, it will be because those interventions didn't work. And that looks like more of a plausible, we tried and we tried and we tried and we failed, <laughs> than Furman was kind of a bolt more out of the blue. Um, and, and, and came at a very uh, quixotic inflection point, you know, on the heels of the 60s, but at sort of at the, the beginning of a huge crime rise that made it particularly vulnerable. So we're not as worried in the book, and we do talk about this, about backlash um, following a Furman II, if and when it comes. Um, well, so, um, what I was going to ask relates to Devin's point on, so I'll ask a slightly different version of it. You know, I was really struck, Carolyn, your description of the relationship between the death penalty and the Southern practice of slavery, especially the lynchings, the legal lynchings, um, and the story you told about the deputy sheriff and his involvement in, in thwarting the court, um, uh, or at least Justice Carlin. Um, and you know, it strikes me that I mean, I also am optimistic about the abolition of the death penalty through the court. And I wonder, so maybe what you just said answers the question. But it also strikes me that you know, we have had a recent experience of backlash um, politically that has led a lot of us to realize that what we thought we understood about the drift of the country was not actually the drift. And so I wonder. If, so I hear what you're saying about the regulatory side and the Supreme Court putting it sort of. Um, I mean, the history of the Supreme Court regulation of it actually preparing the ground. But I wonder if in your, you know, I know you two are both close to the ground just watching what's going on in the States. I wonder if you have a feel for what the political result might be of a Supreme Court abolition and how do you think that might shape the court's practice and um, just, you know, what, what do you think the lay of the land is? I think the lay of the land is, is pretty non-committal to the death penalty. I mean, even in Texas, I mean, we're supposed to be, you know, ground zero of the American death penalty. There's not really, you know, when I came to Texas in the early 1990s, there was a constituency for the death penalty that was very vocal and powerful, victims' rights groups, and that's really virtually disappeared. Um, and so Harris County, which, you know, is Houston and, and was the center of the death penalty in Texas, has not had death sentences in the last few years, and there's just a, a real change in culture. And um, so I, I really think that the Supreme Court is probably going to wait a little bit more for the political process to move in the way it, it's moving. Um, Utah almost abolished the death penalty last week and wanted to be the first Utah. red wanted to be the first <laughs> red state to do so because Nebraska, which was the first red state to do so recently in, in its unicameral legislature, voted to abolish the death penalty, and the governor um, basically led an effort to, to bring it back through referendum. So even in the reddest of red states, there's an increasing concern about the death penalty. And actually, there, what's interesting is in the red states, there's more of this is consistent with our position on life. There's a more of a moral absolutist position as opposed to the pragmatic smart on crime, which is what I think in the bluish states or purplish states, the people who want to get rid of the death penalty want to build a bridge to the people who they might not support it. So they don't call their movement an abolition movement, they call it a repeal movement to take away the connotations of the fight against slavery. And so in, you know, in Maryland and Connecticut and other places, um, the abolition of the repeal has been um, done on pragmatic grounds, but it's looking like in some of the reddest of the red states where the, the culture of life is at its strongest, that there's, that it may actually be fought on moral absolutist, you know, human dignity, life grounds. Jordan and I were listening in to the Nebraska legislature when they voted to abolish the death penalty and we're like, <laughs> we were on the phone with each other when there was a long thing about what the people who were being crucified on crosses next to Jesus thought about the death penalty. And I was like, what? <laughs> was like, that was like a big thing. Like there was a big discussion on the floor of the Nebraska legislature about like I didn't even know there were other people on crosses next to Jesus. And I didn't know that. I didn't know they had a position on the death penalty. They were against it. <laughs>
um, that have arisen with the death penalty contribute to a constitutional basis for abolition? So it's sort of the, the causal contribution is that the pragmatic concerns, which have made it very hard to have death sentences and executions, um, have marginalized the practice. And, the, and sort of the, the way that the court's Eighth Amendment architecture is, um, is that a, a punishment becomes unconstitutionally cruel and excessive when it's no longer serving its avowed penological purposes. So I think that the pragmatic concerns and the kind of issues that are happening in California um, make it hard to say that the death penalty is plausibly serving any deterrent purpose when you have so few death sentences, so few executions, um, or that it's serving some important retributive purpose when the vast majority of people who commit murder are not sentenced to death. Um, this was Justice White's argument in Furman. I mean, he was the one who, who focused most on the, the problem, it, that the death penalty being excessive because of its in, real sheer infrequency. Um, and I think that, um, that, I mean, that's certainly part of the argument. I mean, there are other pieces in it. So in the, in the Supreme Court's decisions that have uh, invalidated the applications of the death penalty to certain populations, to juveniles, persons with intellectual disability, persons committed a, who commit non-homicidal crimes, the court sort of emphasized, you know, um, a whole bunch of criteria that are now, that are softer criteria than just how many states actually support the practice. Um, and those things are also trending in ways that make it much easier to write an opinion now than when the court wrote Furman in 1972. I should just mention, too, that uh, there was, well, still is, a promising case pending at the Supreme Court right now called Hidalgo out of Arizona, which is a direct challenge to the death penalty and also a challenge based on aggravator creep. Um, and so that you can find that sort of petition on the Supreme Court website, and it lays out very clearly the case, a constitutional basis for abolition of the death penalty. We've been hoping it was going to go there, but the case has now been relisted about eight times. So I think what's likely to happen is we're going to see a very long descent from denial of cert. Hello. Uh, so obviously with Powell, we have this, this, this uh, baseline litigation that you have to have effective counsel on death penalty cases. But I also agree with Professor Baxton that Prop 66 is going to lead to less effective counsel, that lawyers are being stripped of their actual power. And I was wondering if you have any historical cases like that where practicality concerns have led to qualitatively worse counsel. Well, there was a case that the Supreme Court just denied um, out of the Fifth Circuit where the lawyer failed to ask for funding or wasn't given, asked for funding, wasn't given enough funding to do the kind of work that was required in the case in the Supreme Court denied cert and Justice Sotomayor said, you know, there's this interaction between, you know, the, the failure of resources and institutional arrangements that are just simply not capable of allowing for effective representation. Um, but the court has always had a lawyer-centric view. It doesn't look at the broader institutional constraints which render people ineffective as lawyers. And it, you really have to identify some, you know, egregious errors by counsel that aren't traceable to the failure to get funding from the state. So, I mean, this has been a perennial problem. Um, and, I, and I agree that uh, it sounds as though Proposition 66 is going to, you know, cause more ineffective representation, but not in ways that necessarily are remediable. So telling people who take non-capital cases, all of a sudden, you're now capital appellate lawyers, is kind of a crazy way of dealing with the on-the-ground problem that there are simply not enough qualified, experienced people for the, the backlog of the death sentence, or death sentence people in California. So let me ask the last question. Um, you wrote the book before President Trump was elected. Three right? days, it came out three days before. It came before. out one day. <laughs> one it came day. out Monday, November wow. 7th. We, we wanted the galleys back to change our prediction of the horizon. Here's <laughs> 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 my question. My question is, I, I get that you, you take a, a long-term view on this issue, right? But is there any part or parts, are there any parts of the book that you would write differently today, knowing 
the, the, you know, the result of the election and what has happened since then. Right? Well, there, there is a chapter called The Future of the American Death Penalty. Um, and we did make a prediction, um, writing the book, that the death penalty would be abolished between, within 10 to 20 years. So while we were writing the book, we had that in the book. And then in February 2016, Justice Scalia died. So we're like, change that, <laughs> five to 10 years. And then President Obama appointed Merrick Garland, who was a great guy, but he was on the Oklahoma City bombing prosecution team. So we're like, yeah, back to 10 to 20 years. <laughs> so that's what made it into the final galleys, which were hit the presses November 7th. So we were not able to change. I would not, I'd say 10 to 20 years is not honestly likely. Um, I think I it's... Think well, See? to the extent that we still have a constitutional democracy in 10 to 20 years, <laughs> I would say that it's likely. Yeah, I don't think so. But, um, <laughs> but hopefully, in, I, think, I think this is the real prediction. We do think that a, a lot of the forces that we identify are going to continue to push capital sentences and executions to the margins and make it a more marginal practice. And to the extent that that remains the case or continues even along that trajectory, ultimately the Supreme Court will give the death penalty the coup de grace. When that will be, I predict it will be in your life, but more like when you're dandling your grandchildren on your knees. Um, and less like when I predicted at the end of one of my death penalty classes, when you're taking your 10-year-old to soccer practice. So that's, that's, that's what I think. Thank you so much.